Jobtron. Here it is, ladies and gentlemen, a big one, a huge one. John Tron's top 20 favorite SNES games of all time! But John, that's so original. Shut up, Jacques! If I want to do this list, I'm gonna do it! You know what? I don't want to be in your stupid show anymore. I'm going to make my own show. Furthermore, we all know what the Super Nintendo is, so I'll spare you the boring introductory details, but I will say this. The SNES is home to some of the finest games in all of gaming history. You know what's great about the SNES? They didn't have the power to make games like this. God damn it! They had to actually use their brains to get around the limitations. Games had to be inspired to be successful in the SNES. They couldn't bank on rainbow graphics doing the work for them. Visuals did not amend the fact that gameplay flaws stuck out like brown on rice. Brown and that's what I love about it. These games made you feel something different. They took you to another world, another plane of existence. And perhaps that's why I am the way I am today, and not like this, you know. I just want to clear up. These 20 are not what I think are the absolute end-all best. <laughs> Measure it out. These are just my top 20 favorite. In no particular order, this is just the way they happen to fall on my emotional scale! You're accepted! Number 20. Remember when you were a kid? This is perhaps the extent of what a puzzle game was to you. Simple, devoid of color, maybe a little boring? Yeah, Tetris was fun, for like, a minute. But Mario had worlds, and adventure, and mystery, and Tetris had falling shapes. So chances are, the first time you saw the cartridge for Tetris Attack, you thought to yourself, hmm, what could possibly be so attack about Tetris? Little did you know, though, that you were completely wrong. This game actually had more attack than Orson Welles on his 21st birthday. <laughs> I guess they thought the Japanese version, Panel de Pawn, was a little too much Asia for the American release, so they dumped the little girls and added in Yoshi and friends. Pretty simple concept here, link the blocks and destroy them before they get to the top. Sort of like reverse Tetris if you can imagine. What this game had that no other puzzle game I'd played at the time did was personality and maybe even a hint of atmosphere. You simply didn't get that with older puzzle games at the time. It was like a Mario game in a puzzle game, mind-bending. It even had a story mode which for some reason always appealed to me in games. Kind of like the minigame story mode in Mario Party. And oh god, that music. That's some good music! Let's face it, you may not like this game, but there is nothing more satisfying than doing this to your friends. Number 19. What is this game? I don't even know. I could look it up and spoil the mystery for myself, but you know what? I'm not gonna ruin 16 years of wonderment for the purposes of this list. Do you think your cancers are gone now? Yes, I believe that, because God never lies. You're gonna stay just as much in the dark on this one as I am, so buckle up. The curiously named Maui Mallard in Cold Shadow, from what I understand, is a game where Donald Duck changes into a Hawaiian shirt, puts on a blue hat, and then turns into a ninja? Yeah, that just about covers it. What the hell is this game? Is that even Donald Duck? Who's Maui Mallard? You have no idea what kind of confusion this caused for me when I got the game way back when. I was expecting a Disney game I knew and understood, and I got this weird... Thing. That being said though, Cold Shadow turned out to be an unexpected classic. Sure, the controls may be a bit wobbly compared to today's standards, but you gotta love the eerie feeling it just radiates. The whole game, so... weird. I guess I have nothing more to say really, but this game will always stand out to me as an underrated gem. Number 18. Firepower 2000. Yeah, what? You never heard of Firepower 2000? What, have you been living under the average person's roof for 20 years? Oh, well then, yeah, you probably haven't heard of Firepower 2000. This little-known Sunsoft title, known to my father and I colloquially as Helicopter and Car, is a most unfairly overlooked game in the scrolling shooter genre. You could pick from either being a yellow helicopter or a green tank jeep and blast your way through the legions of... something. Yeah, the bad guys never really specified, so... Yeah! Blindly following the supreme word of a tyrant! Yeah! From the second you start this game, you know that this shit is for real. Listen to this music! See? This shit is for real! 
I know I say it a lot, but this game, 100% atmosphere. It's actually kind of scary at times. I mean, look at this boss. The weapon system, completely unique. For how much quality this game emanated, I'm entirely surprised that it's not as highly discussed as, per se, UN Squadron. In my opinion, it's even better than that game. Who knows why this game didn't do so well? All I know is that I love it, and you should too, God Flapjacks, damn it! Number 17. Another Disney game, eh? What is this, Nazi Germany? I just gotta say, Disney games back in the SNES era were of unusually high quality. Some other good examples being The Lion King and Toy Story, but nothing quite reached the level of our Arabian Prince Aladdin. Even the Genesis version wasn't quite up to snuff with the SNES version. Hmm, I wonder why. Oh... That's right, the SNES version was made by Capcom! Hell yeah! But seriously, Aladdin for SNES had it all in terms of gameplay, graphics, and design, and if that weren't enough, it has my personal favorite Disney hero at the helm. So many good times with this one that I can't even count. And I just gotta say, something about these jumps are just so satisfying. Any way you look at this one, Aladdin for SNES knows where it's at. Number 16 Pink dude sucking shit up? Cute! Let me rephrase. Pink monster eating denizens of the forest, digesting them, and using their souls to beat the shit out of more forest creatures. Yeah, it doesn't sound like playtime at the nursery now, does it? Everyone knows and loves Kirby, but how did he get where he is today? Sure, back in the days of Game Boy and NES, he had some pretty good and standard titles, but Kirby Superstar is what put him on the map. Pretty much everything you know about this pink adorable thing originally stemmed from this game. Man, talk about good controls. Kirby Superstar is in the dictionary next to that. This game was pretty much as simple as it can get without being criminal, yet so fun and replayable because you could pretty much play any part any way you wanted, and with liquid crystal gameplay. Not to mention eight games in one, holy shit! Okay, it's not really eight games in one, but that doesn't change the fact that this game is legendary. Number 15. Remember back in the days of Wonderment, where you'd go to a Chuck E. Cheese and see this game, and you'd play it with your friends, and you'd fight over the pizza, and nothing could be better? Then you'd go home sad as shit because you knew in your calloused heart that your family couldn't afford a $2,000 arcade cabinet of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? But that's when it happened. You turned your head wistfully to the left, and through your window descended Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time. For whatever reason, SNES ports of arcade games usually sucked, and arcade machines were way more powerful in terms of hardware. But Turtles in Time was pretty much a perfect port, minus some audio and animation downgrades. I can definitively say that this is without a doubt my favorite arcade-style beat-em-up of all time, and one of the best multiplayer experiences on any console ever! Amazing sound effects, fluid animation, great hit detection, and fantastic bosses. When you think of gaming bliss, you think Turtles in Time. This is not only a great SNES beat-em-up, it's one of the greatest of all time. Number 14. Mode 7? More like Goat Heaven. <laughs> what do you mean, Rider's Block? Fuck you, how about that? God damn it, I love me some F Biro. I mean, three Clearo. I mean, B Hero. I mean. Okay, I, I can't think of anything to write about F Zero, but I love it, and so do you. And it deserves the number 14 spot. We cool? We cool. Number 13. What is this thing, you may be asking yourselves? Well, I'll tell you, that's the Super Game Boy, and I was just as confused as you were when I first saw it. Got this bad boy on Christmas, and I'd never seen anything like it. As it turned out, though, it allowed me to play Game Boy games on my TV. How sweet! Your Game Boy games even got a sweet specialized border. In a way, this was a savior back in the day, because the geniuses behind the first Game Boys decided to implement highly reflective screens with no backlight, essentially meaning that you could either play it in extreme lighting conditions against six dog titties, or not play it at all. And say the Super Game Boy didn't appeal to you, you could have also waited until the N64 era for this piece of shit. Want to either transfer your Pokemon to Pokemon Stadium or play only Pokemon Blue through Silver on your TV? Well, then this guy right here is just the thing for you. Number 15. 
number 12. Super Patrol? Oh, you have a 12 on the list? I understand that for some reason this game is as highly praised as Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Jesus Christ, but I'm just not as big of a fan of it as most people. Of course, I wouldn't put it this high on the list if I didn't enjoy it. I still love this game immensely and think it's one of the finest games for the entire console. What this game did right was, well, everything. I'd never seen such detail given to a game before. The music is beautiful and blends perfectly with the environment. The sounds are crisp and realistic. The controls are fluid and natural, and it's still perfectly playable to date. And you've heard this all before. Honestly, who doesn't love Super Metroid? I think it's pretty much a mandated fact that you have to appreciate this game if you like the Super Nintendo. I love this game, but you know what? For me, it just barely misses the top 10. Why do I always hear from people that this game sucks? It totally doesn't. Maybe it was the drastic change in style from the previous two Donkey Kong games, but I honestly saw it as a welcome change. It is more cartoony, but you know what? I think it's better if a game series feels like three different games rather than one big one. It keeps things fresh and interesting. In Donkey Kong Country 3 Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, you played as Dixie Kong alongside the fan favorite, Kitty Kong. Okay, let's face it, no one likes Kitty Kong, he's stupid as shit, but we're not gonna let one little sprite ruin an entire game for us, are we? Blue Pants McNanner hands aside, this game is pure awesome all the way through. Immersive worlds with fantastic music to match them. So many completely detailed and well thought out levels, and just perfect game physics. I've played this game so many times, and it never gets old. I have no idea why Shigeru ever said these games were devoid of gameplay a decade back, because I think it's quite the opposite. I think I prefer how Donkey Kong games control compared to old Mario games. However you may feel about this issue, you certainly can't call this a bad game. In fact, it just happens to be one of my favorites. Go to normalboots.com right now to see a new JonTron original. And if you want to follow us on social networking, go to facebook.com slash JonTronShow or twitter.com slash JonTronShow.